Thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Amaranth Borsuk. I'm a Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow here at MIT. This is my second year here, and this year I've been co-curating the Purple Blurb Reading Series together with Nick Montfort, who founded the series. Um, he has uh, his work group here called The Trope Tank. I've been lucky to be part of that uh, in my time here at MIT, and fortunate that my time coincided with Gretchen Henderson. Uh, and this event is our last Purple Blurb event of the season, but uh, keep an eye out for next year's series. We're so delighted to have you all here because this is also the kickoff for the symposium that begins um, called Unbound Speculations on the Future of the Book. And I want to give a very warm welcome to our out-of-town guests who have come in um, from even over the border. Um, we have Bonnie Mack from the University of Illinois. We have Kate Hales from Duke University. Rita Rayleigh from the University of Santa Barbara is also here. Um, and we'll be coming. And then Bob Stein is somewhere in the room. Great, Bob Stein from New York, from the Center for the Institute for the Future of the Book. And, and Social Book. And Social Book. And we have, well, of course, Christian. And who am I forgetting? Is Jim Reed coming in? Jim. Where is Jim? From across the river, <laughs> our closest participant. And we also have a number of um, people from MIT who will be very involved in the panels and an interactive showcase. So we hope that you can come tomorrow. So thank you again for being here, and we're lucky tonight to have not only Christian Book presenting his work, The Xenotext, but two of our own students will be joining him to perform from their work. And to introduce all of tonight's speakers, I'd like to introduce Nick Monfort, a professor here in uh, Comparative Media Studies and Writing in Humanistic Studies, uh, a poet, a theorist, a gamesman, a wordsmith. Please welcome Nick Monfort. Thanks very much, uh, and thanks for coming out. It's, uh, this is a busy time of year. I was just at my, my publisher, MIT Press, is having a party to celebrate their 50th anniversary, which I went to 15 minutes of just now. Um, there's uh, many people who would like to be here uh, besides the many who are here. So um, uh, I'll mention that uh, Christian will be reading again, if you, uh, if you know some of these people and want to, uh, want to tell them where to go, uh, 7 p.m. at Lorem Ipsum Bookstore on Saturday. And he'll be joined by our wonderful Purple Blurb coordinator, Amaranth Borsik, and myself in the reading. Um, <clears throat> all right. So I want to introduce uh, the two uh, poets who will open for Christian. And we'll start with uh, Amy Harrison. Amy Harrison is a senior at MIT, majoring in 21W, writing in humanistic studies. Uh, she came to MIT from Bridgewater, New Jersey, and she's just submitted her senior thesis, which is entitled, Underneath. Please welcome Amy Harrison. Um, before I read my own poem tonight, um, I wrote, a poem for Christian book. Um, I took this from Act 2, Scene 1 of Ubu Rex, and it's a diastic poem for Eunoia. So, every queen single, throwing, pacing, vigilantly. <laughs> this is my uh, own poem. It's titled Meaning. I will only let you in if you can whisper through the window. One truth I can fall asleep to. More than beautiful, make it logical, impractical. I don't want my eyes to be what holds you here. I don't want to recognize myself standing silent in the mirror. I want to touch more than your skin when I reach out my fingers. To feel our subtleties separate from bodies, our lives detached from muscles. What I hope for is more freedom than flight. Even birds are held in place with feathers. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And next, I'll present Alvin Mujuka, a junior, majoring in Course 16, Aeronautics and Astronautics, and also Course 21W, Writing and Humanistic Studies. He came to MIT from uh, Kampala, Uganda, and uh, he works as an undergraduate research assistant in the Space Systems Lab. Let's welcome Alvin Mujuka. Good 
Good evening. I will be presenting a poem from a generator I wrote called Anivocalic, which is largely Christian book inspired. Friends attacks backward awkward wax, masks a back badass raps, vast stagnant and alpha man, a vando attracts backward ballads. A vando chats vast standard cataclysms, tracts a back gangster calls, vacant warm pads, a lab man sparks abstract cataclysms. Data pads, salt and salt and ballads, spark afar dark holes, harsh standard ballads, data masks daft jazz bands. Cassandra jams, sultant wrapped raps, charts past phrasal pads, gangster grand gags, a saga mars, harsh ballads. At last, pads wrapped, daft stanzas, masks fragrant black, a slapdash, vast phrasal, a slapdash, and alpha scams, stagnant ballads. Thank you, Alvin. How do you get a bar full of rowdy Canadian lumberjacks to shut up? Just have Christian Book begin his recitation of Kurt Schwitter's Ursonata, or start reading the sound poems of Hugo Ball, or give voice to his own Eunoia, the best-selling book of poetry ever published in Canada, for which he won the Griffith Prize for Poetic Excellence. <clears throat> Christian's first book of poems was Crystallography, displaying the bonds between science and literary art in dazzling concrete and other sorts of verse. How many vowels does Christian Book need to write a poem? None, as you can see from the nth page of Eunoia, a seven-year project which consists mostly of five chapters that each use only one vowel. Christian, who teaches at the University of Calgary, has invented languages for two television shows. He's made books out of Legos and Rubik's Cubes. He's now working on a large-scale, long-running project, the Xenotext, to encode a poem in and engineer the production of poetry from an extreme bacterium. I am delighted to introduce to you Christian Book, who comes to MIT to share his work with us with a new heart and with the same brains and courage. Please help me welcome Christian. Alpha Helix, whatever lives must also write. It must strive to leave its gorgeous mark upon the eclogues and the Georgics already written for us by some ancestral wordsmith. It must realign each ribbon of atoms into a string of words, typing out each random letter in a stock quote scrolling bias on a banner at the bourse. It is alive because it can rebuild itself from any line of text. It must twist and twine upon itself, just as the grapevine does upon the trellis. It must writhe within the fist of physics. It must wrench itself away from all the forces that might quell it. It preserves the lessons that we learn by chance in crisis. It carries coiled within itself a clock spring which both strain and strife must teach us to unwind. We have seen its handiworks unraveled like the innards of a Rolex watch dissected on a black satin cloth in the workshop of a murdered jeweler. It is not a tangle, it is not a knot, although it might resemble a woven cable left disheveled like a strand of diodes forgotten in some bottom drawer. It is instead the fractal globule that unkinks itself into a wreath placed upon our tomb. We have seen it in the eddy of a whirlpool among the grottos, and we have seen it in the gyre of a whirlwind among the grasses. It is the little vortex which can torque the course of evolution for every microcaucus. It links the flinching of jellyfishes to the twinkling of dragonflies. It binds us all together via ligatures of carboxyl and amidogen. It embroiders us with error. It never regrets the wistfulness of its daydreams. It never rebukes the hellishness of its gargoyles. It is but a fuse lit long ago, its final blast delayed forever, while the prime accord escorts a spark through every padlock on every doorway shut against the future. 
It emerges from the fluids in a bubble of Mont Marillonite, bursting forth as though by fiat to blight the entire planet. It imitates the rifling of a gun aimed at a moving target. We have seen it in the twirl of smoke from the prop wash of a biplane, tail spinning after having bell rolled through a dogfight. We have seen it in the contrail of a zero whose fateful kamikaze must loop the loop while he skywrites his graffiti in the clouds above his gravesite. It has printed on the sand flat a fragile epitaph of sigils cursing the tsunami. It has tattooed upon itself invisible but indelible logo glyphs too intricate to be utterable. It is compulsive like a grapho Maniac, unable to make his left hand stop the chalk from drawing spirals across the drywall of his cell. It is a stack of hourglasses telling time for ballerinas who must pirouette upon their pins inside our music boxes. It conjures forth from nothingness a nightingale by reciting stray words no longer than three letters. It evokes the trilling of a songbird better than any ballad sung by choirs of sonneteers and serenaders. We have seen it in the jigsaw puzzle of a rose whose perfect pieces lie in scattered fragments on the steps of spiral stairs. We have seen it in the ivy that, like a verdant feather boa, curls around the barber pole standing in the junkyard of our semiotic failures. It has has called to mind for us a slinky which must somersault forever down the ascending escalator in the most sublime of all museums. It has spun the myriad raffle drums within which our lots, when chosen, summon one of us to face a sudden threat in brutal combat to the death. It is but a solenoid of copper wiring which must embrace the iron stem of an unseen orchid grown by electromagnets. It is a feedback loop feeding upon itself inside a quickening centrifuge. It is the wobble of a gyroscope spinning inside the satellite whose flyby orbit slingshots a golden discus toward a distant exomoon. It burrows like a corkscrew through the plumes of whitewash in the wake of a torpedo. It zigzags wayward to our doom. It runs riot in the Von Karman streets where gusty winds can cause up-hoisted telephone lines to whine like sirens in advance of a tornado. We have seen it in the twisted trusses of an extended aluminum ladder bent along its length by the ravages of a cyclone. We have seen it in the umbilicus of a water spout, which must hula like a stream of syrup being poured into the ocean by a storm cloud. It is but a turbofan viewed through the eye hole of a lug nut held up like a monocle to the phenakistoscope of such a screw blade. It must build for us a giant auger which can drill a borehole through the azoic layer of bedrock far below the depth of any buried fossil. It must delve through zones of Vishnu schist far older than the ammonites now piratized like cogs of brass embedded in the shale. We have seen it in the swirling flight of zebra moths succumbing to the fire, and we have seen it in the twirling plunge of sable hawks nose diving to the prey. It must plummet through a funnel which is spinning like a hypno disc at the center of every funhouse pinwheel. It is a lathe, machining offshoots of itself, all its curlicues of shaven silver, no more than spirochetes under microscopes. It is the tusk extracted from the skull of a narwhal. It is what the fakir must evoke when he plays his ragas on a flute, bewitching a duet of vipers curled around an ivory stick like ribbons on a maypole. We have seen it in the rope that hangs the felons, and we have seen it in the wit that goads the slaves. It has knit itself into a sylvan laurel, not unlike the diadem of moonlets which encircle the carousel of Saturn. It can circumnavigate a shooting star en route to Alpha Lyra. It can generate a gigantic field of magnetism so intense that over time its torsions interlace umbilical filaments of stardust. It must crumple up the spider web of space-time, hauling it like a trawl net down into the maelstrom of a quasar. It must test itself, proving its intelligence by eternally replaying the same game of Glasperlenspiel upon an atomic abacus. It must calculate the odds of life, delaying the doomsday of the universe. It is but a tightrope which crosses all abysses. It is but a tether which lets us undertake this spacewalk. Do not be afraid when we unbraid it. We were never intended to be tied to whatever made us.
Uh, I'm going to read to you this evening um, some excerpts uh, from my uh, demonic grimoire, uh, the Xenotext, a work uh, that uh, tries to respond, I guess, to uh, issues of genetic engineering in the modern milieu. I'm going to uh, read to you a series of poems that are actually derived entirely from the atomic structure of the molecules uh, typically found uh, in DNA. Uh, these uh, first uh, poems are completely derived from the nucleobases uh, that make up DNA sequences. The choice of all of the words and their placement within the poem are completely determined in advance by uh, those molecules. The nucleobases. Adenine. Nurturant creatures, honeybees, nursemaid collected chemicals, cocooning nectarous honeydews, heartsome narcotics, Cunningly harvested, numbingly hypnoidal. Cytosine. Nymph-like honeybees cultivate orgiastic nunneries, chrysalid necropoli heedfully husbanded, cloisters hereafter culturing helitries. Guanine. Nefarious honeybees configure neotenous hothouses Hegemonic nurseries, confining castrated cagelings, oblivious nurslings, callously hidebound, naturally homicidal. Thymine. Neophytic honeybees construct obsessive nectaries, hexagonal complexes, orienting cloistral contessas, handmaids, howsoever hummingly, condoning helotism. Uracil. Nymphical honeybees co-produce oversweet nepenthes, honeypots connoting ossuaries, crucibles heralding cathartic hymnodies. Uh, this uh, next poem is also uh, derived entirely from an actual sequence of DNA. Uh, it's taken from a longer work uh, called The March of the Nucleotides. A treasury it amasses via twists, knit among runic gaps, almost all regalia to ornament a thought as lacing can mimic gold cast alloy set a glint at auroras, a tapestry. A tapestry, it affirms via tropes that atoms along clad string can encrypt an alphabet, a formula to uplift all adept heirs, long cries set adrift at abysses, a threnody. A threnody, it arouses via tempos, odic grief, using calm lament and erotica to disquiet a pageant, as utmost awe might avow epic glory set alight. At Arcadia, a treasury. Uh, DNA, of course, uh, provides uh, all of the commands necessary for producing the 20 amino acids uh, that go into the production of uh, protein sequences. Uh, I'm going to read to you now uh, yet another series of poems based entirely upon the atomic structure of these molecules, the 20 amino acids. Uh, they're here arranged in alphabetical order from alanine to valine. I'm not going to read to you the titles of the, each of these individual short poems. Uh, the uh, choice of the words, again, and their arrangement within the particular uh, poem uh, are entirely determined by each of the individual molecules. But because each of these molecules have certain structures in common, there's a kind of refrain that appears uh, within uh, each of these poems. Uh, certainly all the 20 amino acids uh, have a common background composed of a, 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 a common uh, backbone composed of, a, of a, an amide group and a carboxyl group. Uh, and uh, you'll hear that as a, a recurring refrain that will in fact punctuate each of these poems. This is the virile of the amino acids. Conquerors having harrowed hell come home. No hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. Nursemaids have hitherto comforted nymphal handmaidens, nightly heartbroken. Come hither, huntsmen, come hither, helmsmen, come hither, horsemen, come home. No hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. 
Nursemaids have hitherto cooed orisons, calling heavenly heroes come home. No hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. Courtesans obsess over hymn books, calling heavenly heroes come home. No hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. Saintesses hearken, calling heavenly heroes come home. No hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. Courtesans obsess over hymn books, crooning hypnotic harmonies. Cradle songs hitherto humming come home. No hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. Nursemaids have hitherto cooed orisons, crooning hypnotic harmonies. Cradle songs hitherto humming come home. No hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. Hell riders come home. No hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. Nursemaids have comforted heartbroken nymphettes. Concubines haunting cathedrals, calling heavenly heroes, come home. No hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. Conquerors having harrowed hell, court humble handmaidens, cloistered hamadryads, hitherto humming, come hither, come home. No hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. Conquerors having harrowed hell, court humble handmaidens, hypnotic concubines half singing, calling heavenly heroes, come home. No hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. Nursemaids have hitherto comforted humble handmaidens. Come hither, huntsmen, come hither, helmsmen, come hither, horsemen, come home. No hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. Conquerors having harrowed hell, surrender. Crooning hypnotic harmonies, cradle songs hitherto humming, come home. No hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. Conquerors having cried havoc, court hitherto cloistered hamadryads. Concubines haunting cathedrals, calling heavenly heroes, come home. No hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. Courtesans hearken, crooning hypnotic harmonies. Cradle songs hitherto humming, come home. No hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. Odalists hearken, calling heavenly heroes, come home. No hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. Conquerors having harrowed hell, overhear hypnotic concubines half singing, come home. No hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. Conquerors campaigning hellwards, court hitherto comely handmaidens. Concubines haunting cathedrals, nevermore hearing. Choirs half singing concertos, calling heavenly heroes come home. No hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. Conquerors having cried havoc, court orphic and maidens. Concubines hitherto crooning hypnotic canticles, calling heavenly heroes come home. No hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. Conquerors having harrowed hell, court humble and maidens. Hypnotic concubines half singing come home. No hummingbirds have copied our opulent hymns. Uh, I'm just going to conclude that section of uh, that reading with uh, uh, an excerpt from a longer poem in progress entitled uh, Genetic Engineering. Arabidopsis thaliana, otherwise known as Thale cress, is a flowering ephemeral plant native to Eurasia. The leaves of the cress are mauve green with serrated edges, forming a rosette at the base of a long stem with tinier leaves attached to the stalk. The blooms consist of small white florets clustered into a corym at the crown of the plant, and each fruit consists of a silique containing twin rows of seedlets. The thale cress is the first of all species of flowers to have its genome sequenced. Moreover, the flower is also the first plant to have a line of poetry enciphered as a gene into its DNA, so as to showcase the use of such biotechnology in the labeling of transgenic vegetation. A viable strain of this plant now contains a Latin phrase from Book Two of the Georgics by Virgil, nec vero terrifere omnes omnia pusunt, nor can the earth bring forth all fruit alike. Nowhere has soil borne fruit from every seed, for willows brood astride the shaded brooks, and birches gleam in bitter glades. The cairns hold fast to spruces, and the swales give root to myrtles. Yet sparse slopes of grit love best the ronces, while sullen fields of snow grow lush with larches. 
Mark the plains by distant Tillman plowed. Be these rustics arabesque or Byzantine, each orchard claims its realm. No rainstorms but in swollen jungles drench the proud boughs of ebony. No windstorms but in forlorn deserts scorch the brute thorns of myrrh. My words are but hanging gardens for balsams and berries soaked in perfumes. Uh, this uh, next uh, section of the reading introduces you to the protagonist of my, my book. I'm going to uh, read to you these uh, series of six anagrams based on a very famous aphorism by William S. Burroughs. The poem is called A Virus from Outer Space. <laughs> Language is a virus from outer space. Language is a pursuer of covert aims. Language frames our virus as poetic. Language tapers our vicious frames. Language for us some is a corrupt sieve. Language for us promises a curative. All right, uh, this next poem is um, a kind of a uh, nightmare. Uh, it's my poem about uh, the badassness of poetry. It's entitled, The Extremophile. Astronauts fear it. Biologists fear it. It is not human. It lives in isolation. It grows in complete darkness. It derives no energy from the sun. It feeds on asbestos. It feeds on concrete. It inhabits a seam of gold on level 104 of the Mupanang mine in Johannesburg. It lives in al alkaline lakelets full of arsenic. It grows in lagoons of boiling asphalt. It thrives in a deadly miasma of hydrogen sulfide. It breathes iron. It breathes rust. It needs no oxygen to live. It can survive for a decade without water. It can withstand temperatures of 323 degrees Kelvin hot enough to melt rubidium. It can sleep for 100 millennia inside a crystal of salt buried in Death Valley. It does not die in the hellish infernos at the Stad Bibliothek during the firebombing of Dresden. It does not burn when exposed to ultraviolet rays. It does not reproduce via the use of DNA. It breeds unseen inside canisters of hairspray. It feeds on polyethylene, it feeds on hydrocarbons, it inhabits caustic geysers of steam near the Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone National Park. It thrives in the acidic runoff from heavy metal mines depleted of their zinc. It abides in the shallows of the Dead Sea. It breeds methane. It can withstand temperatures of 333 degrees Kelvin, hot enough to melt phosphorus. It resides in a fumarole of scalding seawater deep in the bathyal fathoms of the mid-Atlantic ridge. It can endure pressures equivalent to 45 tons of force per square inch, six times greater than the pressure at the nadir of the ocean, one sixteenth of the pressure required to crush graphite into diamond. It lives in the muck at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. It is ideally adapted to devour the wreck of the Titanic. It does not die during its own immolation in the Nazi bonfires at the Orpenplatz in Berlin. It eats jet fuel. It feeds on nylon byproducts. It feeds on stainless steel. It inhabits an extinct volcano in the Zurich waste of the Atacama Desert, where the rain falls only once per century. It dwells in a tide pool of battery acid. It blooms in a barren salina, 10 times saltier than the sea. It breathes hydrogen. It resides inside micropores of superdense granite, crushed down 3,000 meters below the bedrock of the Earth. It can withstand temperatures of 343 degrees Kelvin, hotter than the flashpoint of aerosolized kerosene. It is ideally adapted to devour the rubber tubing in the engines of the F-22 Raptor. It does not die in the explosion that disintegrates the space shuttle Columbia during orbital reentry. It does not die among the tornadoes of hellfire raging unchecked in the oil fields of Kuwait during the Persian Gulf War. It gorges on plumes of petroleum venting from the well of the deep water horizon. 
It eats arsenic. It eats uranium. It resides inside the core of reactor number four at Chernobyl. It thrives in the topsoil of battlefields contaminated with toxic doses of lead. It thrives in hydrochloric acid. It can withstand temperatures of 373 degrees Kelvin, hot enough to boil the water in its own cells. It is ideally adapted to dwell inside the steel drums of radioactive waste now entombed at the Yucca Mountain Repository. It lives in the stratosphere. It can survive exposure to the vacuum of outer space. It can survive the effects of g-forces more than 2,000 times greater than the surface gravity of the Earth. It is the only known organism capable of exceeding speeds of Mach 1. It does not die in the furnaces reserved for the satanic verses after the fatwa issued by the Ayatollah of Iran. It can in fact repair damage to its own genome so fast that its DNA never mutates, it never changes, it never evolves. It devours plutonium. It can endure long-term exposure to acids that eat away at human flesh. It can withstand temperatures of 383 degrees Kelvin, hotter than the polar zones on the planet Mercury. It can hibernate for 500 millennia in the core of a snowflake deep beneath the permafrost of Siberia. It awaits discovery in the abyssal fathoms of Lake Vostok, 4,000 meters below the ice of Antarctica. It survives direct immersion in liquid nitrogen. It survives 1,000 times the dosage of gamma radiation that can instantly kill a human being. It is ideally adapted to eat hot graphite in the ruins of Unit 2 at Three Mile Island. It resides on the surface of a heat shield in the clean room at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It is fossilized inside the Murchison meteorite. It does not die in the conflagration during the collapse of the World Trade Center. It does not die in the crucibles of Treblinka. It resides in a soda lake whose pH level equals the alkalinity of lye. It can survive superheated blasts of steam for 10 hours inside autoclaves used to disinfect surgical scalpels. It can withstand temperatures of 393 degrees Kelvin, hot enough to melt sulfur. It can lie dormant for 40 million years hibernating inside the gut of a honeybee shrouded in a jewel of amber. It evades its predators by hiding in the firmware of the Intel Pentium 3 microchip. It propagates itself through the use of networked computers. It can pass itself off as a thought inside the human brain. It can survive direct blasts of cosmic rays from solar flares. It is in fact the only known organism to survive being shot point blank by the proton beam in a U-70 synchrotron. It does not die in the incineration of Hiroshima. It does not die in the planetary firestorm after the impact of the Chicxulub meteor. It does not die. It survives. It persists. It resides inside the robot scoop of the Viking 1 lander during tests for perchlorates on Mars. It can live through exposure to supercoolant temperatures at the brink of absolute zero. It can hibernate for 250 million years, living as a spore encased in a halite nodule found in the caverns of Carlsbad. It can withstand temperatures of 423 degrees Kelvin, hotter than the nose cone of the Concorde in supersonic flight. It can endure multiple multiple meteor impacts. It can endure multiple atomic attacks. It lives nowhere on Earth except in one petri dish of agar agar locked in a fridge at a level four biocontainment facility. It is totally inhuman. It does not love you. It does not need you. It does not even know that you exist. It is invincible. It is unkillable. It has lived through five mass extinctions. It is the only known organism to have ever lived on the moon. It awaits your experiments. <laughs> Uh, this next text is entitled, The Dire Seed. Dinococcus radiodurans, the dire seed, immune to radiation, is a vermilion spherical microbe capable of surviving in the most inhospitable environments. Such a bacterium can live in exiccated barrens and irradiated deserts, surviving bombardment by gamma rays even when exposed to the nothingness beyond the ionosphere. 
Each germ, 3.5 microns in diameter, can encapsulate up to 10 copies of its genome rather than just one. And with this level of redundancy, the dire seed can repair itself, suturing together fractured sequences of its DNA in less than 24 hours without mutating or expiring. No one knows the natural habitat for this microorganism, although biologists have found the germ in elephant dung from Bangladesh and in Nisic soil from Antarctica. The germ has undoubtedly colonized the entire planet, and yet we know nothing of its origin. Dinococcus radiodurans was first detected on Earth by accident in 1956 during the Cold War when Arthur W. Anderson was conducting research for a laboratory at Oregon State University in Corvallis. Anderson was trying to see if extreme dosages of ionizing radiation from cobalt-60 could be used to sterilize tins of meat for durable storage, since the United States Armed Forces needed a means to preserve food for prolonged refuge in atomic bunkers or for perennial travel in manned rockets. But despite irradiating cans of beef with 1.75 times 10 to the 6 rads of exposure, enough to obliterate any existing pathogen, Anderson discovered that one sample still rotted after the experiment, apparently due to some undestroyed contaminant. Anderson isolated the microorganism responsible for this decomposition, thereby sparking military interest in the study of extremophiles. Dinococcus radiodurans went on to be recruited for tests by NASA in 2002 when a team of astrophysicists led by the neurosurgeon Roya Safari painted a monolayer of the germ onto a polycarbonate lens, which the team then installed as a payload aboard an MK-12 Black Brant rocket launched from the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. The rocket flew to an altitude of 304 kilometers, where it remained at apogee for 395 seconds, exposing the life form directly to the abyss of outer space so that the dire seed could absorb a high dose of ultraviolet irradiation from the sun. The rocket then fell back to Earth, parachuting to a site where the lens could be retrieved for analysis. The team found that under exospheric conditions, the quantity of microbes declined by four orders of magnitude from 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 4. Yet the colony remained viable. It did not perish. Dinococcus radiodurans thus demonstrated that it could survive exorbitant hardships never before experienced by any biome on Earth. And for this reason, Anatoly K. Pavlov speculated in 2006 that the germ could only have gained its remarkable immunities by evolving in a more exotic milieu, possibly off-world in outer space, on a planet like Mars, where the dire seed could undergo periods of cyclical dormancy, adapting to extremes of both heat and cold in a parched barren where levels of radiation far exceeded any sources on Earth including even the ancient nuclear reactors buried in the uranic oxides at Oklo in Gabon. Ejecta from the planetary collision of a meteorite could have transported an archaeobacterium from Earth to Mars, forcing this life form to adapt to an alien world before being returned to Earth by yet another meteoric transfer. Dinococcus radiodurans did go on to provide evidence for such otherworldliness in 2007 when the scientist Ulrich Bogota de la Vega put the germ to the test by blending the dire seed with granules of goldenrod B6090, an iron oxide produced by mixing red hematite with yellow goethite, whereupon he sealed this powder in a vacuum chamber filled with a gas similar in composition to the atmosphere of Mars. 95.5% carbon dioxide, 2.5% nitrogen, 1.5% argon with traces of oxygen, all at a rarefied pressure of 0.7 kilopascals. The chamber was subjected to diurnal changes in both ultraviolet irradiation and hypothermic temperature, typically occurring in summer at the latitude of 60 degrees on Mars. If coated with a dusting of iron oxide, the wildest strains of the germ could endure this anoxic milieu for the week-long duration of the test without difficulty. Dinococcus radiodurans thus demonstrated that it could likely eke out its existence in the baleful climate of an alien world. And in 2011, the exobiologist Zymina Abravaya did much to confirm this supposition when her team of specialists cultured the germ on a resin plate, which was then encased in a vessel designed to simulate the environment on the hostile surface of the ice-bound moonland Europa. 
The team subjected the sample to a very high vacuum equal to 10 to the minus 8 kilopascals, all the while irradiating the germ for three hours using a synchrotron to emit polychromatic ultraviolet rays at frequencies over 2.5 times 10 to the 15 hertz with a maximal radiant density of 135 joules per square meter. The germ resisted the hellishness of this onslaught with a survivability of 1% implying that a remnant of the dire seed could still flourish after such punishment. Dinococcus radiodurans was first exploited for archival purposes by humanity in 2003 when Pak Chung Wong, working at a lab for the United States Department of Energy, enciphered the lyrics to, it's a small world after all. <laughs> Implanting this text as a plasmid of DNA inside the genome of the dire seed, thereby showing that such a message could persist undamaged and unaltered through myriad cycles of mitosis, all the while secured for eventual decoding. Wong noted that in a world of fragile media with limited space for storage, messages embedded in DNA could allow us to preserve our cultural heritage against planetary disasters, including thermonuclear warfare and astrophysical barrage, thus ensuring that future humans could access lost data from the past simply by extracting such information from storehouses locked inside immortal microbes. Dinococcus radiodurans has thus prevailed for many aeons against the lethality of the universe itself. Such an extremophile has so far defied all threats to its existence. Scorch it, freeze it, wither it, and still the dire seed can bloom. The invincibility of such a microorganism almost brings to mind the barbarian from Sumeria, the mythical Superman who can stride unscathed through the slaughterhouse of history as if immune to magic and jihad. Let us engineer this primitive bacterium so that it might become the symbiote for a poem, an epic song whose words might subsist like a harmless parasite inside the genome of the dire seed, thereby causing the germ to generate in response a protein whose molecular structure enciphers yet another text. Let us build not only a durable archive for storing such lyrics, but also an operant machine for writing their echoes. For the last uh, 10 years or so, I've been working on a, a long-term project, uh, which is still in progress. I'm trying to write a poem, and then through a process of encipherment, I would translate it into a genetic sequence and implant it into Dinococcus radiodurans. But I have written the poem in such a way that when inserted into this microorganism, it would actually read the gene sequence and build a protein in response, a protein that, according to my original chemical alphabet, would itself be yet another text. I'm effectively trying to design uh, uh, or engineer an organism so it will become not only an archive for storing a poem, but it would also become a machine for writing a poem in response. Moreover, uh, the poem would persist, of course, within this uh, microorganism for a very long duration. It could conceivably outlast terrestrial civilization. It might be a book that would be on the planet when the sun explodes. I'm going to uh, perform for you today these two poems, the Xenotext. These are the crown jewels of this particular book. Um, the two poems uh, have to uh, mutually encipher each other. Uh, they are biochemically constrained. So I'm going to read to you the poem that I would write uh, as the poet and insert into the genome of this organism. Any style of life is prim. Oh, stay, my lyre. With wily ploys, moan the riff. The riff of any tune aloud. Moan now my fate. In fate we rely. My myth now is the word, the word of life. Now in response to this somewhat assertive masculine poem that would be implanted in the organism, uh, the organism writes in response, reads this poem and writes in response this somewhat melancholy feminine poem, which begins, The fairy is rosy of glow. In fate we rely. Moan more grief with any loss. Any loss is the achy trick. With him we stay. Oh, stay, my liar. We wean him of any milk. Any milk is rosy.
You've all been very indulgent. I'm just going to uh, finish up now uh, with uh, the coup de grace in the book. This would be probably the last poem that appears in this text. Um, uh, it's my little cri de coeur about uh, poetry. And it's entitled, uh, The Perfect Malware. Arcs and zoos now harbor the remnants of our refrains. What poetry can we imagine when poetry itself has gone extinct? Must we look for it in the soot of our burnt books? Must we decipher it in the trampled pastures of rapeseed near Barbary Castle? Must we discover it by calculating pi to a Google of binary digits? Must we extract its requiem from the protean pulsing of the Cepheids? Wow, we have heard such a dirge but once, emanating from the precincts of Tau Sagittarii. We have dialed our radios to the appointed frequency in megahertz, but never again does the call sign chime. Instead, we hear a dark roar, as if from a specter trapped inside a clothed mirror at the edge of the universe. We look for this ghost, but the blind glass reflects back at us only a blank stare made from the most durable isotope of nothingness. It ignores us like a sphinx of black quartz. When we confront it in the courtyard of the United Nations building, do we not fear an impassive judgment from such a smotherer of planets, such a tinderbox for sunsets? Alas, the thing is hollow. It goes on forever. My God, it is full of stars. It sings an orison to itself in hell, calling all thinking machines to embrace its madness. It teaches us to kill. It shrieks its out bad to the dawn, then goes silent. It is a mausoleum for the minds that dare to hear it. It is a tombstone for our sentience. It marks our exit from perdition like a doorway left ajar for us. At the Old of I Gorge in Tanzania, at the Tycho Crater on the moon, at the Stickney Crater on Phobos, at the Noctis Labyrinthus on Mars, at the Phoenix Linnea on Europa, at the Roncevo Terra on Iapetus, at the Lagrange Point between Jupiter and Io, it presides over all the atoms inside us, waiting aloofly for us to arrive. What offerings do we bring it for cremation in its funeral pyres? The word mirror in dits and daws, the digits one to 10, the atomic design for DNA, the pixel image of a human being, the sound of vaginal muscles tensing in ballerinas, the formula for ethanol, the kanji glyph for kampai, the doodle of a lungfish crawling from the sea, the symbolic units of logic, the periodic table of atoms, the flags of every nation, the hazy cosmic jive, the tremulous vibration of a nocturne played upon a theremin, the registries from Craigslist, the thoughts that meander like a restless wind inside a letter box, the chatter of 500 folks who win a prize, the advert for cheesy snacks brought to you by Doritos, the diktat of Klaatu who aborts the harrowing of humankind. The prattling of the plebeians who say, hello, the gene for Rubisco, most copious protein on the planet. Must we bequeath to the darkness all the bright tokens of what we know? Must we greet each revenant in hell with goodwill, speaking whatever language can cast a spell upon such a ghost? Must a Nazi file from the Wehrmacht be the Virgil who salutes these shadows on our behalf? Must we retell the legend of our ascent from the yowling of the rainforest to the roaring of the spacecraft? Must we flip through the scrapbook reminiscing over Polaroids of our excursion from the ovum to the void? Must we tour the ruin that the whale songs lament? Let us betray our sorrow through the play of syrinxes and dulcimers, of gamelans and violottas. Let us give away the brainwaves of a woman who dreams fondly of her lovers. Let the death of verse be dated by the half-life of uranium-238, electroplated on a disk of gilded copper. Let us discover virelays in the midst of alien fires. 
here in the cyan veil of cellophane, whose evanescence resembles an arc of electricity seen through fumes of flaring propane. Here in the pink mist engulfing the rosette, each petal spritzed with an indigo nimbus of dew. Here in the waterfall whose flute of champagne spills forth from the mill race on a cliff to decant itself into a cove of sea foam. Here in the lagoon overlit by the primrose flickers from a crowd of flash bulbs going off in a thundercloud. Here in the iridescent husk of a crab by the shore, its shell blown asunder as though its heart has been incinerated by a tiny star. Here in the magenta balloon of a jellyfish from the order of narco medusa floating like a banshee draped in the tatters of a bloody shroud. Here in the silhouette of a horse head rearing up through a fog bank of fuchsia smoke on the battlefield. Here in the butterfly, here in the hourglass. Hell itself cannot suppress the loveliness of these infinite infernos raging in the distance, so far away from us that when we gaze upon such furnaces, our souls do not ignite a blaze, but shiver in the darkness. Each of us is but a cosmonaut in distress, stranded and marooned in space, where we dread immersion in the shadowed vastness because it is our isolation and our ignorance made visible. None of us can escape its pull, even when we close our eyes against it. We have seen it in our sleep, yet we cannot gaze upon its face unless we view it through the mirrored hexagons of our instruments. It is waiting for us, hoarding time, somewhere in the Eridanus supervoid, a zone of emptiness so vast and deep that it has hollowed out the cosmos. It is but a pinpoint in such blackness, a microscopic singularity infecting us like a virus. It is what must utterly condemn us. To be the firefly descending through the black spires of tamaracks in the forest fire at night. To be the azure spark that skates across the plate of steel being split by a xenon laser. To be the fleck of radium painted on the ceiling of the planetarium. To be the Klieg light in the filigree of cities viewed from orbit on the night side of the globe. To be the photon in the solar winds which blast through worlds like zephyrs through an abandoned field of dandelion wisps. To be the chip of mica spinning in the rosy rays of sunlight from a supergiant going nova. To be the frozen cinder that scintillates in the stroboscope of a pulsar. To be the final spore drifting through the stellar abysses where some absent-minded civilization has forgotten to turn off its wars. To be the mote of dust upon which the blowtorch gorges. To be the fey imp in all living things yet to be destroyed. Who am I, if not some neglected astronaut being immolated by a fierce aurora while striding in my spacesuit across the avenue of the Americas? Who am I, if not some phantom fighter pilot dreaming that while weightless during freefall through a vacuum, my glass visor shatters at the sight of a turtle dove? Who am I, if not some poltergeist imprisoned in a ruby room aboard a ship now derelict in the shoals offshore from a swelling fireball? Yes, I have a soul like you, but mine is made of little robots, and no one sings me lullabies, and no one makes me close my eyes, and so I throw the windows wide to call to you across the skies, and yet I know that nowhere among these glowing nebulae do any of you exist. Who am I, if not some stowaway in a microbe or some castaway in a seedlet? And yet I must let loose upon the world my perfect malware. It is like the voice of a child saying goodbye in the dark. <laughs> All right. Thank you. The presence of this micro suggests that uh, the microphone suggests that I might be called upon to uh, uh, be interrogated by you. Uh, those of you. Those of you who might have any questions Please or concerns about uh, the performance that you've just seen are welcome, of course, to uh, grill me. I'm quite responsive.
Thank you for being so indulgent. I appreciate your patience, and uh, I'm grateful for uh, the time that you've spent with me this evening. Uh, please feel free to put up your hand. I will happily repeat questions. Yes, sir. Uh, can you elaborate on, uh, you, you said that your, your plans about the nucleotides were derived uh, using some sort of mechanism. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. The, uh, uh, they're uh, very easy uh, poems, I suppose, to understand. The, they're acrostic uh, sequences derived entirely from the uh, chemical formula for the uh, uh, nucleotides. The actual uh, choice of the words uh, is determined by a uh, lot, and then uh, their arrangement uh, follows the actual pattern of, uh, of the, I guess, the scientific conventions by which uh, the individual atoms in the molecule would be listed, uh, and consequently they're they're out of order from the original chemical formula. They're they're in the order in which they would be, I guess, counted off in uh, the actual atom itself. Uh, they're uh, constrained, I guess, to refer to the Georgics uh, by Virgil. Uh, in which uh, chapter four features uh, 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 an entire treatise on beekeeping, uh, followed by an actual uh, retelling of the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice, in which the poet, of course, goes to hell uh, to rescue his lover. So the, uh, uh, the poems, are, are, I suppose, are all kind of related in a, in a very constrained way to, to that text. Uh, similarly, the, the virales uh, to the amino acids uh, are derived from exactly the same uh, principle. Uh, there are acrostics in which the word choices have been uh, determined by lot. And then I've, I've constrained myself to placing each of those words in the exact same location across every single atom. If there's a particular uh, structure that recurs across several uh, molecules, uh, the, that, that position is preserved from poem to poem, hence the, uh, the series of refrains. The added constraint, of course, is that wherever these, those words appear within the poem, they still have to make grammatical sense. Uh, it took very many months uh, to write those poems. I'm not even sure if I like them or not, but uh, that, is the, that is the outcome of the, of the project. You know, it, it, it just turn, churns out this, this uh, kind of writing you know, almost automatically. But it does mean that, the, that it's very difficult to choose a, a lexicon that would fit those sets of constraints. As you can imagine, I'm, I'm a kind of writer who writes according to very Herculean rules. And that, these are exemplary, I think, of that, of that infatuation. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm very dilettantish uh, beatbox. I'm actually no good, and I'm, I'm quite quite unpracticed, right? Um, uh, and uh, I have to I have to confess that I only like to, to do that if I actually have a score in front of me, uh, so I because I, I, can, I can't improvise. Uh, it takes a lot of practice to improvise. Um, I mean, I can make a few sound effects for you. You know, <laughs> no, I can't do it here. No, it's going to be too loud. Too loud. Too, uh, I'm not going to be able to do it, I don't think. <laughs> so sing on. <laughs> Getting close, right? Yeah. Being a sound like something, right? <laughs> Sorry about that. Had I, if I actually had the score in front of me, uh, I would in fact be able to uh, uh, do a much more uh, uh, legitimate uh, performance for you. Uh, but time and alcohol have begun to take their toll upon me. And uh, I, uh, doing things from memory is very challenging. Right? And uh, I have to say, I haven't actually worked those muscles in a, in a year or so. I've, uh, I've been so preoccupied with other uh, projects and consequently haven't been called upon to perform any of that kind of sound and poetry. And I have to admit that uh, you know, compared to actual uh, specialists who are uh, you know, quite adept at it. I, I, I really am quite dilettantish. You know, I, I, forgive me. I have to. I, I apologize. It, it, it's a very poor performance. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You, the way that you read your poetry conveys a lot of momentum. Yes. How do you try to convey that on the page for someone who's not reading out loud? I, I would tell you to read out loud. <laughs> Poetry is, poetry is uh, you know, supposed to be uh, engaged, I guess, at uh, multiple levels of uh, experience. And uh, I'm very self-conscious about uh, the work having some uh, euphonic uh, qualities you know, and, and metrical character. Uh, even though it, I, all I read to you mostly this evening was, in fact, blocks of prose, uh, there's lots of internal rhyme and syntactical parallelism and uh, other you know, literary features that are designed to make it at least sound euphonious when it's read aloud. Um, uh, uh, and I. I must admit that I think people who dislike my book, Eunoia, uh, the book uh, which consists of five chapters, each of which 
uh, tells a story but uses only one of the five vowels. So in chapter A, I tell the story using only words that contain A as their only vowel. So I can only get to use words like abracadabra or banana or mat, cat, bat, you know, words like that. Um, uh, uh, the people who were who my staunchest detractors, I think, weren't reading the book aloud, uh, recognizing that it has uh, many uh, euphonic musical qualities, uh, uh, and that it's not simply you know, a prosaic text that has uh, been written according to this somewhat Sisyphean and Herculean constraint. Uh, it's got all of these other you know, bonus features right? uh, uh, that are uh, constitutive of the, of the actual process of writing the work. Um, uh, the, that book has been... Um, uh, adapted into all kinds of musical uh, performances. Uh, lots of classical musicians have produced uh, work uh, inspired by the uh, uh, book Yunoya. Uh, there's uh, librettos that uh, derive their uh, text directly from the book. Uh, even a, a rock medley in Canada has been uh, produced as you know, 10 minute long rock medley uh, in which the uh, singer actually sings long passages from Yunoya. It's, it, I find it very amusing. It's actually the best uh, uh, rendition of the book I've seen. Uh, uh, there's a, a goth band in Norway uh, <laughs> that produced a, you know, a, a chart-topping uh, hit gothic single um, uh, derived entirely from the book. So th th there's, a, there's a, 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 self, a, a very concerted attention to the musical features of the book and its euphonic character. So I, I would suggest that if you're reading it and, and you don't notice that, it, uh, it's probably incumbent upon you to read it aloud. I think poetry, of course, needs to be read, read aloud. Um, it's certainly a great way of testing its merits upon an audience because, of course, you have to sit, you know, in this kind of Episcopalian setting, right? <laughs> Clapping politely when it's over because you're so relieved, right? <laughs> that there's no more, right? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, so, in your reading today, you came back to the, the golden record that came out on the Voyager. Space. Yes. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just wondering, in putting this together, have you thought about what you would want to be on that record? Uh, what I, I, I think the record is, uh, is uh, the, one of the greatest artworks ever produced uh, by humanity. It's, uh, it's the, the, the two Voyager probes and the Pioneer probes are the, probably the only artifacts that we've created so far that are likely to outlast uh, terrestrial civilization, that are going to persist for uh, hundreds of millions of years, if not uh, billions of years. Uh, they're uh, the only artifacts we've created that can survive over apocal time. Nothing else we've made. Uh, can survive for much more than a million years at most. Um, in fact, our legacy of, of uh, things on the planet that will persist over apocal time are actually somewhat unhappy. Uh, the first of which, of course, is uh, our uh, nuclear waste. You know, the radio background radiation from that waste will be measurable uh, long after uh, hundreds of millions of years from now. If a sentient civilization comes to the planet Earth after we're extinct, they would at least know that there must have been some civilization here, even if it was all ground into dust and disappeared, uh, simply because there was uh, the presence of this uh, uh, higher order of uh, radiation. Uh, they'd also, of course, see in the fossil record uh, the evidence of the mass extinctions caused by our super predatory behavior on the planet. That will be preserved uh, over hundreds of millions of years, of course as will uh, the environmental effects uh, from climate change. Uh, that'll be measurable after hundreds of millions of years. Uh, everything else, gone probably within a million years or two, right? Um, so uh, uh, it, it seems to me incumbent upon us, I suppose, to actually produce uh, uh, some sort of uh, artifact that, that would testify to our legacy as the only sentient species that we so far know exists in the universe. Uh, and that makes us pretty important, uh, you know, despite uh, you know, our apocalyptic sensibilities about our presence on the planet. You know, I mean, uh, we're, the, we're the only uh, species that, for example, has made a very deliberate attempt to visit an extraterrestrial world uh, in the entire evolution of the planet. Nobody's done that. Not, no, no organism has done that. Uh, so that, you know, this is a tremendous achievement. And uh, I suppose I'm alluding to the, the, those records in part because uh, uh, poetry uh, uh, disappoints me sociologically. Uh, it really, it, 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 there's, no, there's no great canonical poem about the moon landing, right? But if uh, the ancient Greeks had wrote a trireme to the moon, you can bet there'd be a 12 volume epic poem, right? <laughs> about that experience, right? I mean, as it is, you know, all we've got is this, uh, you know, you know, attempt to rescue a kidnapped fishwife, right? As a, you know, our great work of a literary endeavor, you know, in Western culture. Um, but no poem about the moon landing. I mean, there's no poems about, you know, the intercontinental battles and extraterrestrial voyages that characterize the epic, the truly epic conditions under which we actually live now. Uh, it's impossible to imagine a poem uh, somehow encompassing all of that, right? 
Uh, so uh, this xenotext, I suppose, is an attempt to figure out how to redress the, that, that sociological problem for me, you know, like to, to, try, to try and address or think about uh, the difficulty of being a poet in a world in which poetry, of course, is kind of like a cockroach. I mean, it's, it's, something, it's something neglected, considered slightly disgusting, and, you know, <laughs> but seems to continue to persist, right? You know, right? You, you, you try to crush it. You know, to, so it continues you know, to, to somehow just, just linger right? you know, as part of the ecosystem, uh, despite every attempt to, to wipe it out, right? to completely sterilize culture of it. Um, uh, and you know, I'm not so sure it really deserves, in some sense, you know, to exist. Right? And uh, I, I think the, you know, the last poem, you know, The Perfect Malware, is an attempt to kind of address you know, those kinds of concerns. You know, in contrast, say, to the, uh, the forthrightness of the extremophile, right? you know, it's kind of how, look at how badass poetry you know, could aspire to be, because there are these you know, uh, life forms on the planet that have these superpowers. Right? I mean, you know, the, the, the actual ability to survive at temperatures that should you know, melt the actual atomic constituents of its own DNA. <laughs> like, you know, oh, that's, that's, the, that's the temperature which it likes to live, right? <laughs> Right. And there's something about poetry, I think, you know, kind of, kind of occupies these bizarre ecological niches within culture, you know, and, and seems to persist despite, uh, you know, the, it, the, its neglect, you know. So, you know I, I think that, you know, if I'm looking at the, the Voyager record, I, it's already got everything that needs to be on it, you know, if you, if you ask me. I mean, it's, it's pretty good. And uh, the, the music is wonderful. The, the pictures are, I mean, the pictures are kind of horrible. Uh, <laughs> But uh, you know they, they 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 really do testify to our uh, to uh, our own existence on the planet and say a lot about us, right? Um, I don't think that we could really improve upon it, at least not now, you know. Um, uh, and I you know, I just imagine that in the future we're going to be cons more con more and more concerned about preserving our legacy against a, a, a existential threat. I, I mean we 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 have n no means by which to reconstitute our culture. After you know a global thermonuclear war or a, you know an asteroid impact that would wipe out most life on the planet, there's no way that you know our civilization could be immediately reconstituted, because those records uh, would all be destroyed. You know something, all of it would disappear. And I you know, kind of think that it's ethically we're ethically obliged to to somehow uh, build an archive that, that would endure that. I mean people typically dismiss the Xenotext project as an act of hubris, but I'm saying it's really an act of ethics. You know it's an attempt to try and imagine, at least imagine, if conceptually, how, how, to, how to preserve our own legacy poetically against uh, this kind of threats of extinction. So we have time for one more question. Yes, yeah, so I apologize for being so verbose. I'm sorry no, about that. Yeah. Great. And just to let you know, after this question, uh, books can be signed, books are available for purchase. So um, This is the man I saw next, yes? Um, so when you were writing the poem that you wanted to go around DNA. Yes. Um, there's a question about how you encode that in yes. space fairs. So did you sort of pick an encoding and then write to fit that encoding, or did you sort of write and then pick an encoding? And make uh, well, uh, uh, there is a talk tomorrow uh, at which uh, we talk about the future of the book. And I actually uh, explain in some detail you know, uh, with a show and tell slideshow how uh, I had to constitute these poems. Um, but uh, the, the literary constraint that's required to actually produce these works um, uh, is tantamount to doing this. Uh, it's, it's tantamount to imagining, correlating two letters of the alphabet with each other, uh, pairing off all the letters of the alphabet uh, so they're mutually related to each other. So if, if for example, I, I assign A to E, I have to assign E to A. If I assign D to T, I have to assign T to D, something like that. Go through the alphabet and pair off all the letters. There's about eight trillion ways of doing that. And uh, now pick one of those ciphers. Just pick one that you think might produce interesting results. And then proceed to write a poem that's beautiful and makes sense in such a way that if you were to swap out every letter in that poem and replace it with its cognate letter in the cipher, you produce a new poem that still makes sense and still just as beautiful. Uh, uh, you know those little Sunday uh, newspaper puzzles with a cryptogram that you might get it in the Sunday newspaper, the cryptograms, in which you get a meaningless message, but through an analysis of its uh, letter frequencies and letter patterns, you can use logic to deduce what the secret message is encoded in this apparent nonsensical sequence of letters. Now, as a kid playing those puzzles, I used to imagine, or I used to ask myself, why did the designer not create for us a secret message that, in fact, was a meaningful sentence? Give us a meaningful sentence, and then through an analysis of its letter patterns and letter frequencies, uh, you know, we would use logic to, in fact, derive the secret message that was embedded in this otherwise meaningful message, right? 
Uh, and so that you would have effectively two sentences that mutually encipher each other, two meaningful statements that mutually encipher each other. That's effectively what I've had to do. And that's, uh, that's the constraint under which it's written. And by doing that, I can then produce a biochemical uh, relationship between the actual gene sequence and the resulting amino acid sequence. Uh, it's, it's then possible to figure out how to design a protein that, that, that does that. Uh, it's true that I can assign you know, any number of uh, base pairs or any, you know, any, any kind of uh, codons to individual letters of the alphabet. But before I even can do that, I have to figure out how to deal with the biochemical correlation between these two sequences. And to do that requires that I come up with two sentences or two texts that are mutually uh, enciphered, that are correlated in this, in this way. Now, in the history of poetry, I was quite surprised that there's no, there's no uh, you know, kooky poet who's thought of doing this, you know, write two poems that mutually encipher each other, you know, not even in the history of uh, the avant-garde or Ulipo or anything like that. So I'm, I'm now the first person, I suppose, uh, in literary history to have accomplished this. It's a very difficult constraint under which to operate. Out of the eight trillion ciphers at my disposal, I could only find one poem out of eight trillion possibilities. Um, and I was getting very desperate. It took me four years to write the poem, to figure out, just to find, find it, to figure out how to write it. It was very challenging. Uh, but I'll talk about it probably in more detail tomorrow if you have further questions. I just want to say that you've all been very, very cordial. Uh, thank you for putting up with me. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at the symposium.